Welcome to a program featuring interviews of state and federal candidates as well as incumbents from districts serving Clatsop, Marion, Polk, Tillamook, and Yamhill counties. I'm Angela Plowhead, an advisory council member serving Northwest Senior and Disability Services Advisory Council. I want to welcome candidates, incumbents, and advisory council members to the 2020 Candidate Interview Forum, which is sponsored by our Senior Advisory Council and our Disability Services Advisory Council. Northwest Senior and Disability Services is a local governmental organization that provides Medicaid, Oregon Project Independence, Older Americans Act, and grant-funded programs. The mission of Northwest Senior and Disability Services is to promote dignity, independence, and health, honor choice, and empower people. The assistance and support we provide to consumers include information and assistance, in-home and community-based services, financial and medical help, meal site and home delivered meals, options counseling, adult protective services, Medicare counseling, peer mentoring, money management, as well as health and wellness programs. Because of the number of state legislative districts that our service area covers, we have invited a large number of candidates to our candidate interviews. Each candidate has been given information on the format used in these interviews. Each candidate will be introduced by a member from the advisory councils. Then each candidate will have the opportunity to answer questions which will be timed. That way you, the viewer, can compare apples to apples. We thank these candidates for their willingness to share their views about services for Oregon seniors and people with disabilities. Hi, I'm Roxanne Wilson and I'd like to welcome Ibra Tahir, Green Party candidate for U.S. Senate. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, I was wondering if you could tell me how your platform will influence you to vote for seniors and people with disabilities. Well, well th thank you so much for, the, for this question. Um, unfortunately, our country is shifting economically. So when we talk about seniors, we're talking about the economy and the, and the, the like, uh, main uh, aspect of this question and the other thing we're talking about the culture how is it shifting so usually when we talk about seniors we're talking about who is taking care of them and with what money they uh, they they're able to take care of them um, now we uh, it is not a hidden truth that the country is going through really an um, a disastrous economic um, time and if we want to really um, take care of our like vulnerables, um, the elderly, the, the, the kids, and other like social services. We need first to make sure that our country is economically sound, and we cannot have that if we continue doing um, the policy, continue having the policy that we have right now, which is really um, just helping the big corporations, the 1%, uh, concentration of the power, <laughs> stripping the power from the uh, the economic bubble that we have. That now most of the states are suffering. Um, only the 1%, those wealthy people are benefiting, which means that all of the services that we have, we need to slowly let them go away. And we cannot have that. We cannot have seniors um, um, services. We cannot have any other social services, disability services, if we don't have the money to do that. And if we don't have the money to do that, I don't think that we can survive. So fixing the economy is a major issue here. Thank you, so, Ira. Also, the, the Older Americans Act provides critical programs that help 258,000 older adults in Oregon. As Congress considers funding for fiscal year 2021 and 2022, how will you protect and continue to increase funding for older, the old, older Americans Act and other aging and disability programs? Yeah, as I said, um, the, the problem with funding is the, uh, the, the budget, the whole budget, this discretionary mm -hmm. budget mm -hmm. of the country. And if we don't have really a sustainable budget, the sustainable uh, economic power, then we, we cannot be um, really talking about any funding, any, any sort of funding. That's why some um, um, people in the Congress and the, the government suggested to cut some social, social services. Um, the idea is not 
um, just like to hate people who are like uh, older or maybe hate people who are disabled. This is not that uh, what they think about. They think about how we can afford it. Right now, I, I, I think most of you know that uh, we reached um, a record um, a national debt, which is 25 trillions. And by the end of this year, it's going to be 30 trillions. And 40 million Americans are without any jobs, which means the taxes, the revenue needs to go to unemployment. That's a huge deficit. Thank you, Ibra. Thank you. Um, speaking of the economic turndown, um, how would you address food insecurities for people in all demographics, especially for seniors and people with disabilities, even during times of uh, economic crisis? Yeah, well, um, this question is really one of the major issues that we need to worry about because with the COVID-19, uh, I think we learned that we don't have a sustainable um, um, food supply. The, the, um, the, the supply chain can be broken really easily. Uh, and that's thanks to, to, to policies that concentrated the power, the economic power, the production power in the hands of the few. So most of the states, they don't have um, regional security in terms of food and products. And this is really um, a worrying uh, issue that we need to stop and think about it because you're talking about food insecurity and that food insecurity is only related to the economic structure that we have so in order to get rid of that we need to localize the economy and have a, an, an, a regional sufficiency thank you Thanks. what are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors people with disabilities and people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre-existing conditions yeah, so this question has two folds. One of them, the healthcare issue, uh, which is which is related to the health insurance market and um, the healthcare that they can um, can get uh, from healthcare providers. And the other one is how to improve it with regards to the environment. We know that um, for the second part of the question, that our country is controlled by corporations. Corporations care about for uh, their profit. That's why they corrupt our uh, politics. And uh, because of that, we can see um, a lot of examples like glyphosate now, which is proven to be carcinogen, uh, just st still on our shelves and nobody's talking about why, because the FDA, the EPA, the Congress um, is really owned and uh, influenced by these people. So the huge issue is to end the corruption in our government and governmental agency to do that. Thank you. What will you do regarding Medicare and Medicaid to help Oregon seniors and people with disabilities in their homes with access to mental health and substance abuse services? Yeah, so this this part, this question is related to the um, uh, the first part of that question, which is how to improve the healthcare insurance and the healthcare providing system. Um, I propose, I advocate for single healthcare, um, single payer healthcare system, which means there's no need to worry about the Medicare programs or Medicaid programs. Everyone gets the uh, healthcare that he deserves that she deserved to get, and it is a single uh, payer pro program, that sh which means that um, the government would save money and the citizens would not be worried about getting the healthcare that they deserve. So expanding or initiating this single healthcare um, um, system would eliminate all of these problems that most of the people right now complaining about when, the, when they deal with Medicare and Medicaid. Great, thank you. Um, last question, what will you do on a federal level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible, affordable housing? Yes. Yeah, so again, this is a huge issue. We are suffering from the grab of power, which is affecting several things. Not only the products that we we have, uh, it's all it's it's also affects the real estate market. Right now, we don't have a balanced wages versus uh, living expenses 
which uh, which reflects on the real estate market, people cannot live. Um, 12% uh, before COVID, 12% of the people live in poverty. So this is before COVID. And with COVID now, with the, the inflation that is going to happen, we are heading toward, toward a disaster. So the to answer these questions, to fix these problems, we really need to overhaul the whole monetary system in our country and really avoid what is going on here. Um, this is part, part of um, a long um, overdue uh, policies. Thank you, Ibra. I really appreciate you joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, this is Ibra Tahir, Green Party nominee for U.S. Senate. Hello, my name is Betty Sledge. I am a volunteer with the Senior Advisory Council at Northwest Human and Disability Services. Today I'm interviewing uh, Amy Ryan Corser. She is a Republican candidate for Car Congress, District 5. Um, we're going to be asking Amy some questions related to uh, seniors and people with disabilities. So welcome, Amy. Thank you for sharing your time. Thank you for having me. So we'll start off right with a, a simple question. Um, I hope it's simple. Uh, how will your platform influence how you vote for seniors and people with disabilities? Sure. So one of the important things to me when I um, entered the race was um, was was our seniors and uh, and our disabled and making sure that they have a voice and that they're not not only not left out but that um, that someone is paying attention to the intricacies of how the programs work and where the funding needs to go and how it needs to get there not just that it needs to you know, be approved and, and passed through Congress, but it needs to actually be applied and have, I'm a person with um, with my past experience having solution oriented and making sure that the funds go to where they're supposed to go and that there's accountability is important to me. Um, so, and of course, some of my favorite people are aged and my grandparents. And so um, we have a lot of room for improvement and we can make sure that they're well taken care of. So. Okay. Well, uh, speaking to that being well taken care of, the Older Americans Act uh, provides critical programming for our seniors um, and it helps about 258,000 older Oregonians. As Congress considers funding for the next fiscal uh, year 21-22, how would you protect the Older Americans Act and continue uh, increased funding for that act and other programs that deal with the aging and people with disabilities? Sure, I think that's a great question. The important thing is to make sure people are educated on the data and the information, and, there's, and that changes all the time, right? So it's important that when we're fighting for these um, for these bills and advocating for our seniors, that we have the information correct, that we're, um, we're sharing information because it's very impactful to know how many people are affected and what are the needs because those needs are changing and we're adapting constantly. And with society and some of the things in our community that are happening, we have have to be paying attention to make sure that their needs are being met. And so I feel that that's going to be one of the number one's responsibilities in Congress is to make sure that not only is, is do we continue the funding, but obviously we need to grow the funding, we need to increase the funding, we need to know and be um, be creative about where that funding comes from. So we're not just constantly asking for money, we're finding solutions and, and creating programs and even new programs as we move forward with adapting to the needs of our seniors that um, that, that, that money is not only there, but that it's actually actually in the account, so. Okay, great. So during this uh, economic downturn that we are currently in, how would you address food insecurities for people among all demographics, but especially vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities? Sure. I think we've done some great work on um, reaching the disabled and the seniors that are in need. I think we could do better at um, communicating the services that are available. I know our local area has quite a few services in some areas and in some areas not enough. And so it's important to talk about the need. I know I, as a volunteer, I deliver food constantly to a lot of different uh, different um, residents in different um, areas of and HOD, you know, the HUDs. Um, and so I 
I find it really important that we are um, keeping um, keeping up with the community needs, but talking about what um, some people have higher needs. And I think I've seen some progress with things like food programs and utilizing food better than we have in the past, and um, moving from you know really healthy foods and making sure that everybody has access to good cho healthy choices is really important. And I think we're seeing things, especially with our agricultural. You know, if you look at that platform, people are doing a better job of reusing. And making sure that they have access to all the food for for them to be healthy so okay so what would your plans be to improve the health of vulnerable seniors people with disability people of color who traditionally suffer from uh, more health disparities because of pre-existing health conditions sure well i think Having an advocate who's in their lives, making sure that they're taking care of themselves. I've seen that be an issue. I, I work a lot with our homeless and there's a, there's a definitely a deficit of people who are um, are not doing as good a job taking care of themselves and their needs and they don't feel like they have the services available or they don't want to ask for the services. So I think, again, we kind of fall into that communication and, and, and providing services for the different needs. In other words, behavioral health, mental health uh, versus somebody who's just struggling and, and, and not able able to, you know, affordable housing or affordable foods. There's so many things that fall under one umbrella that I think it's critical to know what services are available and then make sure that they have an advocate that they're doing the, the healthy, making the healthy choices and doing the doctor's appointments and following through so that the people with pre-existing conditions can continue to be taken care of and they don't fall off the radar. It's really important to keep them involved and keep them being seen and in front of for their health care providers. Um, no matter, I, I don't see it as a... As, I know you talk about the different uh, socioeconomic or people of color. I don't think it matters. I think everyone deserves the same quality of care. And I think especially our seniors, we need to be making sure we're taking good care of them. And I think there's some program solutions. I have some ideas that I would love to, um, to talk further about so that we can take care of them. Okay, great. So what would you do uh, regarding Medicare and Medicaid uh, to keep seniors and people with disabilities in their homes? with access to mental health and substance abuse services. Right. Well, that's. I think that's one of our number one issues, personally, that I've seen firsthand. Um, it, it comes back to the homeless, but if we could keep people in their homes, give people resources, make sure they're being checked on, make sure there's accountability for everyone. And I say accountability in a loving way, making sure that they are eat, getting the, that healthy food we talked about. So, but that gap between uh, Medicare and Medicaid, we need to make that transition easier, smoother. It, it it shouldn't be such a financial hardship to make that transition. And I think that's where we're losing. Um, we're losing a lot of the opportunities to make sure people continue to get the health care that they need or to continue because um, behavioral, you know, counseling, whatever, uh, you know, the services that they're already maybe having that they need to continue and not be, not change or stop because they um, don't have the financial services or wherewithal to do that. And we need to keep them in their homes, number one. I love that you said that because I think that's something really important. We have to find a way through all of these health crises and issues and the transition for that financial transition to make sure that they can stay in their homes and that they're protected and safe. Okay. And uh, lastly, what would you do on a federal level so that seniors and people with disabilities would no longer have to face a lack of accessible and affordable housing. Absolutely. It that's again. That's probably our most critical is keeping them in their homes. That affordable housing is an issue. But going through health crisis, the health crisis we're in now, it's really easy to um, to take the easy way out and to use the status quo. And that's not good enough for our seniors. That's not good enough for the people who are struggling who are already um, who are already in the system. And we have more obviously coming and flooding the system because we're and we need to do a better job not only with what we have but to grow it and to make sure everybody has the services. So um, I think. I, I, when you say, what can I do? When I'm in Congress, I will fight and be an advocate every day and communicate with people like yourselves, people who are in the industry, who live and breathe it and know what the needs are. That's not my background, so I don't pretend to be an expert in it, but I can sit around myself with people like yourself who can talk to me about laws and new uh, legislation coming, things that I need to have on my radar to make sure that we're paying attention so that not just am I, I'm not just a vote. I'm a person who is an advocate to make sure that everybody's educated so that we can go and fight and, and fight for our seniors. And so they can't change their votes in Congress, all of us, if we don't have the right information. And so I'd like to be that catalyst as well. 
Okay, well, that's wonderful. Well, Amy, thank you so much for answering some of these difficult questions and spending a portion of your day, uh, um, you know, advocating for our seniors and folks with disabilities and uh, just giving us the gift of your time. So again, this is Amy Ryan Corser. She is running for U.S. Congress, District 5. Hello, I'm Judy Richards, and I'd like to welcome Shemia Fagan, Democratic uh, candidate for Secretary of State. Hi, Judy. I'm happy to be here. What has motivated you to run for Secretary of State? Judy, I've been in Oregonia my whole life, and I've never voted any other way than vote by mail, which up until recently is about the most boring topic in Oregon politics. <laughs> but unfortunately, right now, more than ever, Oregon's really groundbreaking vote by mail system is under attack like never before. And I think Oregonians deserve a secretary of state who will stand up to attacks on the Oregon way of democracy. I'm such a strong believer in democracy as a member of, I've been on the school board. I was a member of the Oregon House. And I'm currently a member of the Oregon State Senate because democracy, when it really works, is really the best hope for kids like me. I grew up in Eastern Oregon. I'm a rural Oregon kid. Dufer and the Dalles are where I grew up. My dad was a single parent raising three kids by himself, having a hard time making ends meet. My mom battled meth and opioid addiction and homelessness for most of my life. I remember visiting her once when I was in high school and she was living under somebody else's porch on a sleeping bag to cover the dirt floor. But I also know that because of a wonderful state like Oregon and the services that Oregon provides, when my mom passed away in November, in October of 2014, she'd been clean for almost six years and was living in the first house she ever owned out in Umatilla, Oregon. So I also know that democracy is the place where your circumstances in your future are not determined by the circumstances of your present, that you can make a change in your life, and particularly in a place like Oregon. And so I have spent my career as a civil rights attorney, as an Oregon legislator, and now running for Secretary of State, fighting to break down barriers, things like automatic voter registration, and most recently expanding vote by mail with prepaid postage. And so I just think right now, Oregon deserves a Secretary of State who will stand up for our way of life who will make sure that our scarce resources actually go to make an impact in the lives of people who need them the most. Thank you. Um, Oregon seniors and people with disabilities are experiencing fear and anxiety in today's uncertain environment. What is your plan to ensure that all state departments are communicating and sharing accurate, up-to-date information about COVID-19? Well, first, I just want to say that I understand why people, seniors and Oregonians with disabilities and their families and loved ones are really concerned right now uh, because this is a really scary time, particularly for anybody that feels especially vulnerable to this pandemic or to the secondary effects of this pandemic, job losses, housing insecurity, and lack of health coverage. And so it is something that I really understand this is a place where the Oregonian, where the Secretary of State's audits function really comes into effect. The Oregon Secretary of State is the director of the audits division, and the Secretary of State works with the director of that division to identify the biggest risks facing, facing Oregonians and to then have independent, non-biased auditors do the work to find out what can we do better? How can we make sure that our scarce state resources actually make it into the programs and into the hands of people so it will make a real difference in real lives. And I am looking forward to being that for Oregon seniors and people with disability. Well, describe how you're going to promote more opportunities for seniors and people with disabilities to open and maintain their businesses. Well, as you, as you alluded to, the Secretary of State also oversees the corporate division. And I think in particular, we need to make sure that it's a place where main street businesses can start and can thrive. And that's why the very first bill that I ever authored in the Oregon House as a freshman baby legislator was to create the Office of Small Business Assistance in the Secretary of State's office, which I'm happy to say is, is a nationally renowned model. But that is an office that is particularly important right now as 
large corporations, they've got their in-house teams. To, they know what they're doing. It is Oregon's small businesses, our main street businesses, our solo entrepreneurs that really need to have that assistance. And so I will make sure that that office that I helped create as a freshman legislator is fully staffed and thriving during this time so that Oregonians help as a small business owner is literally one phone call away from the Secretary of State's office. Well, how are you going to increase voting and uh, a voice among seniors and people with disabilities, especially those with additional barriers, such as people of color and those who live in residential facilities or uh, homebound who have special needs? Well, first off, I will defend Oregon's groundbreaking vote by mail system, which right now we are seeing across the country how well we have it here in Oregon, that folks that are in a residential facility, folks with mobility issues, don't even have to request an absentee ballot. That ballot comes to them automatically by virtue of being registered voters here in Oregon. And again, registration is automatic when folks interact with the Department of Motor Vehicles. We need to expand our automatic voter registration, particularly I can think of seniors and people with disabilities. There might be circumstances in which they don't get a driver's license. Therefore, they don't interact with the Department of Motor Vehicles. What other places are they interacting with state government so we can make sure that they are automatically registered to vote? But there are a lot of specific things that we can do in our voting system to even improve the wonderful voting, the secure, accessible, safe voting system we have here in Oregon. And one of those is allow somebody with a physical disability that prevents them from signing to actually have a power of attorney sign like they do in Arizona. I know this because an attorney who I hired a few years ago, who is a brilliant attorney, and she's 100% paralyzed from her shoulders down from a car accident when she was a teenager. She said when she lived in Arizona, her mom, who's her power of attorney, could sign her ballot for her. But in Oregon, she has to affix her signature with a thumbprint. And with somebody with a limp wrist that doesn't often twist in the right direction, getting an actual thumbprint for her ballot is really difficult. It makes her they have to have an ink pad at home every voting system, every, every voting cycle. And she said it takes her multiple tries to not have her fingerprint be a blob. So there are specific ways that we can make sure that everybody in Oregon has, is, has low barriers to make sure they participate in our wonderful democracy here in Oregon. If elected, what will you do as Secretary of State to ensure that we have transparency and accountability in Oregon's government, specifically in areas that impact seniors and people with disabilities? This is a place where I think it's important we talk about transparency. We also talk about accessibility. For example, right now there's a website that I think was a good idea by one of our former Secretary of State, Dennis Richardson, where it, it's a whole bunch of state data about state spending and it's on a website. And that's great, but as a young person, I'm only 38, who's actually quite tech savvy, I find it very difficult to navigate and find the information that I need. And I think even more so for folks that might not be my same age and as familiar with computers and technology as I am, or folks with any kind of learning or cognitive disabilities, this information not just to be transparent, but in an accessible format so that people that want to get this information have a user-friendly interface or STAR, for example, which is our transparent campaign finance system here in Oregon, which A, I'm very supportive that we have a transparent campaign finance system that shows where contributions flow to and from candidates and organizations, but it needs to be user-friendly. It needs to be something that someone doesn't have to have a computer science degree or years of experience working with it. So I think that we need to upgrade our technology to make sure that it's not just transparent, but also accessible. So it's marrying the archives division with the audits division. The audits division gives that independent, non-biased information. Then we also need to modernize the actual format in which we put that information out. So the folks, have, my grandparents and my parents will have to be calling me to try and help them access that information so I don't have to go and call my middle school niece to be able to, to navigate computers. Oh, mm. uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, we've been visiting today with uh, uh, Shimia. Fagan, Democratic St uh, candidate for Secretary of State. Well, it's been a pleasure to be here with you, and I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with your with your folks. Yes, and I thank you for joining us today as we went through this interview. It was a pleasure visiting with Shimia Fagan, Democratic uh, candidate for Secretary of State. 
Hello, I'm Angela Plowhead, and I'd like to welcome Tobias Reed, the incumbent Democratic candidate for state treasurer. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm looking forward to when we can have these conversations in person again. But for now, it's uh, it's very good to be with you in this unusual format. Well, thank you for joining us. I know it's a little different. Um, Mr. Reed, um, can you describe your campaign platform and how it applies to seniors and people with disabilities? You bet. Uh, the state treasurer's office is one that I think is uh, often overlooked, but I have a real focus on making sure that we're providing new opportunities for Oregonians, that those opportunities are are fair and that we're building a, a shared resilience that matters for everybody, but especially for seniors and people with disabilities. And we have a suite of financial empowerment programs that are aimed at that mission, uh, ranging from our college savings plan to help people uh, think about what their aspirations are for education after high school and achieve them, uh, to Oregon Saves, our first in the nation opt out retirement savings program, uh, to Oregon Able, which helps people living with disabilities to overcome some of the financial obstacles that they face and achieve the kind of financial security that they deserve. So all of these things, I think, are uh, important contributors to our ability to, to build the sort of Oregon that we want for ourselves uh, and to leave to our kids and grandkids. So the, you mentioned the Oregon ABLE account, and so I have a question about that. So the Oregon ABLE savings account lets people with disabilities save money without getting disqualified from their state and federal benefits, such as SSI, Oregon Health Plan, food benefits, and more. What would you do as state treasurer to ensure that ABLE accounts are more effective for people with disabilities? Well, I think that's a, a great question, and I hope Oregonians are as proud as, as I am of having been one of the early states to create our own ABLE program, but just having it is obviously not enough, and I think one of the most important things we can do is to continue uh, to make sure people are aware of ABLE and how it works for them. We've taken a really grassroots approach, and our team uh, is out in, in the before times uh, in person, uh, working with community organizations and other state agencies agencies uh, to connect with people where they are. We also recognize that we're not always the best uh, trusted partner to, to deliver those messages, so those partnerships are really important. We're going to continue to do that, uh, to talk to people about their experiences so that we can make changes that make the, the experience and the, the product more relevant and more useful to people uh, and the wide range of experiences that they have across the state. If elected, what would you do to increase awareness and security of ABLE accounts? I think that that is the, the approach we'll take, to be very grassroots and very deliberate uh, in connecting with people directly. Um, there's such a wide range of experiences that people have uh, based on the disability they're dealing with, on the place they live, on the circumstances they find themselves in. And those conversations that we have with people are really revealing. Uh, we've made changes to, to our website, for example, uh, about how, how that works and, and how it's designed. We've changed the, the arrangement we have with, uh, with debit cards to make it more useful uh, for people in their, in their everyday lives. And those things uh, contribute tremendously. Uh, but there's nothing better than hearing those really transformational stories uh, from individual people and families. Um, because just as you said, um, the, the ability to remove barriers can be just magical as, as people achieve a, a much better experience. And we're going to continue to do all we can to make that possible. In your opinion, what is the most important role of the state treasurer? And how would you carry out these key roles? I tend to uh, divide the, the responsibilities of the state treasurer into two big categories. One is the, the core uh, responsibilities of state finance, and the other is, is an agenda around financial empowerment and security. When it comes to state finance, we invest the state's portfolio, and we're focused on generating returns. We've boosted our capacity to take in important factors that, that impact those returns, uh, ranging from uh, climate disruption to social justice and, and diversity issues. And we've managed costs by insourcing some important aspects of those functions. 
We're managing our debt capacity really well. Uh, in addition, enabling um, infrastructure around the state, schools, hospitals, roads, bridges. And then we have these range of financial empowerment programs that give people tools, whether it's for, for education after high school, retirement, or um, the obstacles that some people with disabilities face. So those two things, I think, are our core responsibilities. And I feel good about uh, the record we have and the plans that, uh, that are in motion. Mr. Reed, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate you uh, making these conversations accessible in, uh, in challenging times. Absolutely. Well, thanks again to Tobias Reed, the Democratic nominee for state treasurer, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My pleasure. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chuck Richards, and I'd like to welcome Jeff Goodman, Republican candidate for state treasurer. Good afternoon, Chuck. Delighted to be here. We're glad to have you. I go on to my first question. Describe your campaign platform and how it applies to seniors and people with disabilities. Certainly. There are three elements of the my campaign platform for Oregon State Treasurer. Uh, they are competence, integrity, and vision. I've spent a lifetime in the financial field, whether serving as an analyst, a controller, or a treasurer, and I've been a treasurer both in business, in not-for-profits, and uh, elsewhere in almost every organization that I've served, be it Northwest Pilot Project, Housing for the Poor and Elderly, to the uh, businesses where I've been involved in, where I've generally been the chief financial officer. Integrity, because I'm not interested in running for governor. The treasurer's position is the one I want. I'm not using it as a position to run for another position. And vision, whereby I serve all Oregonians, not just one particular group. I'll pay attention and listen with all groups, but I'm campaigning to be the treasurer of all Oregonians. The Oregon ABLE Savings Account lets people with disabilities save money without getting disqualified from their state and federal benefits, such as SSI, Oregon Health Plan, food benefits, and more. What would you do to state treasurer to ensure that ABLE programs account are more efficient and for people with disabilities? That's a great question. The Oregon Saves program is a terrific program, helping people save for retirement, for those who were not participating in a retirement plan at their place of work. So I'm delighted that the program has been going well. The way it can be more effective is, number one, make sure that the administrative costs, which are run through the treasurer's office, are as low as possible. That's the administrative cost both internally to the treasurer's office and the administrative costs where the dollars are being invested. A constant focus on those costs drives down the costs and they'll provide more revenue to the people who are participating in the program. Secondly, is to make sure that on the revenue side or the investment side, that the programs and the opportunities are as safe as possible so that when a person chooses to retire or draw on those funds, that they're gonna be available to them in the amount that the people anticipate. If elected, what would you do to increase awareness and security of the ABLE accounts? Certainly. That's something I've been done a very good job at during my time of service, previous elected service on the Lake Oswego City Council. Almost every month, although not every month, I was writing a column in the local paper, the Lake Oswego Review, talking about the financial issues, the infrastructure issues, all of the issues of the city that impacted me as a city councilor and impacted the residents. I'm a very, very strong believer of informing and persuading the public. And that's a two-way street. But the public can't inform me unless they know what I think so that we can have that discussion about how to make things better. So I would anticipate, as the next treasurer of Oregon, doing all that I can through all of the different mediums available laying out what I'm thinking, and not just simply identifying platitudes like Oregon Saves is a good program, 
offering specifics as to why it's good, what can be done to make it better, and why everybody should be should participate uh, and have expanded opportunities to participate. I think, as President Lincoln said, if you have the people behind you, then there is nothing else that can't be accomplished. And a way of getting people behind you is to inform and persuade through communication. And that's something I've taken pride in through my previous elected service, and I anticipate very much continuing to do so when I become Oregon's next treasurer. In your opinion, what are the most important rules of the state treasurer? How would you carry out these key roles? Certainly. That is probably, I'll call it, the billion-dollar question. As many people are aware, the Oregon Public Employee Retirement System is the uh, alligator eating its tail. It is sucking up dollars which otherwise might go for elder services, for child care, for education, and it's increasing amounts all the time. I have specific ideas that I want to do about that. You have to work with all of the parties, bring everybody to the table, but it's not just something the treasurer coming in and saying, do this. It's very important to have all parties at the table, which means the public unions, which means the uh, government entities, all the players to develop a way of getting out of this problem, because it is a terrible problem that we have, and there's no good answer to it. We're dealing with the consequences of decisions made decades ago. That needs to be addressed. In contrast to my opponent, uh, Mr. Reed, his silence on the issue of PERS is deafening. He says nothing about what it is, how it's going, how it can be improved, how it can be changed. He's the self-proclaimed financial navigator for the state. And I don't know about you, but when the state hires, or if I hire a financial navigator, I expect them to give you advice, explain their thinking, go over their thinking to try and persuade you to the point of view, and to engage in that dialogue. Mr. Reed sadly does not. I will. Thank you once again. This is Jeff Goldman, Republican candidate for state treasurer. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's been a pleasure. I'm Stephen Manessis. I'd like to introduce Melissa Cribbins, Democratic candidate for Senate District 5. Hi, Stephen. Thanks so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to have you. Tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage a senior or person with disabilities to vote for you. Absolutely. Um, so I'm currently a Coos County Commissioner, and so I've been an elected official for about seven years now. And um, as such, I've had a lot of opportunities to work with seniors and people with disabilities. But on a very personal level, um, I have also had my own family members that have been um, senior citizens that have lived with us, that we've really had that experience of knowing what it's like to be a senior and have to um, work really hard to go to a lot of doctor's appointments and need somebody to transport you. So one of the things that's really important to me is that we have good health care on the coast and accessibility to health care is critical. When my father was ill, we had to drive to Portland for all of his treatments. Um, I was always just really thankful that I was in a position where I could help him by taking him to Portland, because some people don't have family members that can drive them back and forth. So it's really critical to me that we continue to have good, accessible health care on the coast for people who need it, especially seniors and people with disabilities. Thank you. Thanks. Oregon, Oregon Project Independence is a cost-effective program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own home. And yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. If elected, what will you do to protect funding for OPI? I would be a strong advocate for OPI funding. Um, I think it's critical that seniors and people with disabilities are able to stay in their homes. You know, one of the things that we need to remember is it's really important that we have complete communities. And part of having complete communities means that everybody gets to stay in a home and a home that, that where they've already built their community. So I would be a strong advocate for continued OPI funding. And um, I think it's, you know, one of the things that my husband and I have really strongly communicated to our children is that it's important that we um, help the people that have cared for us stay in their homes. 
um, I've had my mother-in-law, my grandmother-in-law, and my father all live with us during different times when they were sick, and we cared for them. Um, I realize not everybody has that opportunity, and so it's important that we preserve funding and we allow people to stay in their homes whenever possible. Thank you. You're welcome. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, such as Medicaid, for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? You know, I think COVID has really made it clear that, um, that it's more important than ever that everybody has access to health care. And one of the things that I appreciate that's happened during COVID is that we've kept everybody on Medicaid and, and we haven't required anybody to prove up their ability to stay on there. Um, I would definitely prioritize you know, continued funding for medical care and making sure that people don't have to choose between paying for their prescriptions and paying for their bills. Um, there's a tobacco tax that's proposed right now that will be on the next ballot. Um, I have been an advocate for that. I feel that it's critical that we get a stable, um, steady funding stream for Medicaid in order to make sure that we're not kicking anybody off Medicaid that needs to be on there, especially our seniors and our people with disabilities. Very good. Thanks. During this time of increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible housing and receive appropriate nutrition? You know, housing is such an issue statewide. And, um, and I've noticed every county in the state of Oregon has a problem with housing right now. We just all have problems with housing for different reasons. Here on the coast, um, we have problems with housing for many different reasons, depending whether on your, you're on the middle part of the coast or the south end of the coast. But people not only need access to housing, they need access to housing that's of a certain standard and where they know that they'll be safe. So as a county commissioner, I've been the liaison to Coos Health and Wellness, which is our public health and mental health department. And I've been a strong supporter of investing increased and continued resources in housing for people who are struggling with mental health problems or people that are at risk of becoming homeless. Um, we need to make sure that we're intervening early in cases where people are just about to lose their housing or where they have just lost their housing, because we know that if we can get those people back into housing or preserve the housing that they're in, they're less likely to suffer from all the problems that come from being houseless. And um, we also need to make sure that we are protecting those populations that are the most at risk, such as seniors and people with disabilities. And um, we need to identify areas where government can really make a difference and make those critical investments in areas where they make the most difference. And, um, and I think sometimes this feels like an elephant, right? It's such a big problem, but you know, how do you eat an elephant? You eat it one bite at a time. And that's what we all have to remember. Thanks. Sounds great. What are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre-existing conditions? Yeah. I think part of that is access to health care, right? Um, the ability to have health, mm -hmm. health insurance and the ability to access that health insurance. Um, I became a commissioner just as we were changing the model of how we provided health care in Oregon to this new coordinated care model. And that's made a huge difference for a lot of people. I've talked to many, many people. I serve on the Community Advisory Council for our local coordinated care organization, which has to be a majority of people that are on the Oregon Health Plan. And there are so many people on there that have never had health insurance before in their life. And for those people, one trip to the doctor can be the difference between um, catching an illness right at the beginning or potentially not going and discovering later when it's too late to help them. So I think, you know, early care is a critical thing. And that's part of continuing that Medicaid funding. So people are getting early preventative care and they are able to catch diseases before they become terminal or, you know, require a lot of treatment. 
So it's important that we, sorry, um, it's important that we are lowering the cost of prescription drugs because that's one of the primary drivers of the health insurance um, rate increases. And we need to make sure that we have everyone's voice at the table when we're making these decisions, particularly our underrepresented populations and the ones that are the most vulnerable and the most susceptible because of pre existing conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for your very candid responses. I appreciate your responses. Once again, this is Melissa Cribbins, Democratic candidate for Senate District Number 5. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Judy Richards, and I'd like to welcome Denise Bowles, incumbent Republican candidate for Senate District 10. Thanks, Judy. Thanks for having me here today. Um, this is quite a different uh, forum than we had two years ago. And I am uh, i know we're all missing this opportunity to be together, but I'm glad that you guys figured out a way to um, keep messages going out and us to be able to connect in a different way. Tell us about the votes that you cast last session that directly benefited seniors and people with disabilities. So, you know, there's a number of things that happened last session. Um, there were votes that I was hoping to be able to take that we, uh, that legislation that didn't get through the process. Um, but, you know, we were able to continue to um, provide funding for Oregon Project Independence, which I supported. Um, I actually supported a piece of legislation that didn't get through the process that I hope to see back here next uh, round that would look at ways to expand uh, this program to other parts of our communities. I think it's something that is proven, as we all know, to be very, very successful. Um, I also supported things like paid family leave that would help families be able to have some more flexibility to take care of their family members. And um, uh, let's see here. Um, oh, you know, even the um, supporting the provider tax to expand and, and keep, continue to support our health care system um, for the people in, in Oregon. So there's a lot of things. There's still a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Oregon Project Independence is uh, a program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own homes. And yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. If reelected, how will you ensure this funding continues for this cost-effective program, especially during the uh, during the anticipated budget shortfalls? Well, I think that budget shortfalls. Um will require everyone to really look closely at where money is being spent and looking at organizations and programs that have a success of delivery, which uh, Project Independence certainly has has that. Uh, I am in my new role in the Senate, I've been appointed to the Full Ways and Means Committee. So I'm really getting the opportunity now that I didn't have in the House us to engage more on um, budget issues and priorities as far as spending in the state of Oregon. So I think that there are uh, important things that we can do that protect po programs that are successful. And uh, we're going to have to look at maybe cutting some things that aren't, are less successful. But I don't see, I'm a, a huge champion of project independence and uh, will continue to be in that role uh, within um, the Ways and Means Committee that I now serve on. Thank you. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, such as Medicaid for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Well, I think it's important that we draw down the matches um, to provide health care and services to seniors and um, the vulnerable in our state. Uh, we may, need to make sure we do that in a way that uh, continues to allow some of our programs the flexibility and the um, in, to lack of a better word, independence that uh, help them uh, be successful in the communities that they are uh, serving. So with regards to, um, you know, the federal match, I mean, I, I work in my day job also at Salem Hospital and have been uh, following and engaged in ways that we can provide um, you know, health health services and mental health services, which are important. And there are things that were passed. We actually, for this, this next biennium, we, I think we have six years of the um, health system uh, provider tax, which is Tax is kind of a strong word, but um, helping to draw those matches down. But again, there's we want the federal funds to be able to expand our programs, but at the same time maintain some independence and the things that um, sometimes that money comes with a lot of barriers as well. 
Mm, I see. <laughs> During this time of increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible, affordable housing and receive appropriate nutrition? Sure. You know, this is a complex question and problem and situation we have in Oregon. I know it's a priority of the legislature working with the governor to continue to move this forward. Um, I think some of the practical things that we can do is helping seniors be able to stay, again, stay in their homes, which uh, can involve property tax deferments um, and other other creative ways to take that every, you know, that monthly expense level down, it would be, uh, it's a lot cheaper and a lot easier to um, maintain uh, the home that you're uh, living in than to try to move into either an assisted living or a um, even renting in many cases. So sometimes just a small um, property tax uh, relief, I think is a big, a big thing that we can be doing a little bit more of. Um, as well as just other ways to be able to get, you know, our vulnerable populations, such as our seniors, our veterans, and also I would say, you know, along with our dis people with disabilities, but um, kids aging out of the foster care system. Those are kind of my priority levels when it comes to uh, helping um, stabilize housing, which is incredibly important. So uh, there's there are a lot of a lot of questions on the table that we're going to continue to work forward. But I'm in the process of putting some ideas to paper for the next session that hopefully will help them get us a little bit further across the finish line. What are your plans uh, to improve the health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities? due to pre-existing conditions? You know, in our community in Mary and Polk areas, one of um, the, one of the, a major driver of um, health is, is diabetes. And, um, and that is, and it's also proven to be a vulnerable um, piece in, in COVID also of, of people who are struggling with that. And so there's um, some initiatives around um, kind of that population health and helping people be more healthy in their own, in their own, um, uh, just in their own homes and such. But one of the things I've noticed, I, I serve, uh, I go to different things within the community and we have a lot of language barriers when we're talking about um, giving um, when when there's a translation that occurs from from English to you know a number of uh, of different languages that we have here in this community, uh, there's a barrier there because it's not being translated correctly, and so that people are not getting the right translation in order to make the right healthcare choices. And so I think trying to make broader steps in order to meet people where they're at and understanding that um, you know these are the things that will help you become more healthy will be a big step. And and a lot of that is just a lot of communication um, that we are getting better at, but we need to get a whole lot better. And um, to that said, I've worked with uh, Teresa Alonso Leon and um, trying to address some of these issues in the healthcare arena in particular. So I look forward to continue to make those bridges going forward. Thank you. I want to thank Denise Bowles for her interview today, incumbent Republican candidate for Senate District 10. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Judy. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. We thank all of you for joining us today as we interviewed Senator Denise Bowles. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. You too, now. Hi, I'm, I'm Mel Fuller, and I'd like to introduce you to Deb Patterson, She's the Democratic candidate for Senate District 10. Hi, Deb. Thanks for joining us. Oh, hi, Mel. And so thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. I'm really grateful for this chance to speak with everyone who is interested in the very many issues that Northwest Senior and Disability Services are working with and others in the community. Great. Uh, let's get started with the questions. All right. Okay. Question number one, Deb, tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage a senior or a person with disabilities to vote for you? Uh, thank you. Um, well, as, as the mother of a young adult with 
uh, disabilities. I've been advocating for people with disabilities for over 20 years through the educational system, through the healthcare system, and through legislative advocacy. For the last seven years, I've been a member of the Marion County Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Advisory Board, and more recently, I was appointed by Governor Brown to the Oregon Disabilities Commission. In my capacity there, I also serve as an ex officio member of the Governor's Commission on Senior Services. In the nearly three decades that I've been serving, as clergy, I've worked with myriad older adults in the community, in their homes, and in long-term care. And for 20 of those years, I worked in faith-based health care, primarily working with older adults, including a decade at the helm of an international health organization, working with RNs around the world, helping folks of all ages and abilities lead healthy lives. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, question two. Um, Oregon Project Independence is a, is a cost-effective program that's kept seniors and people with disabilities in their own homes. Yet every year, proposed funding for Oregon Project Independence gets cut. Um, if elected, what will you do to protect the funding for Oregon Project Independence? Uh, yes, as I mentioned, um, as the director of the International Parish Nurse Resource Center, which is now called the Westberg Institute, for a decade I worked with RNs around the world to help people, mostly seniors and people with disabilities, lead healthy lives and access and navigate the healthcare systems. We also advocated for better community access to mental health mental health care and substance abuse programs. Almost always the best option for seniors and people with disabilities is to have the opportunity to stay in their own homes. I was excited to see in the past couple of years the pilot project to expand Oregon Project Independence to include more people with disabilities. Honestly, looking at the projected revenue shortfall for the next several years, I don't know how we can afford not to take a good hard look at the costs of institutionalized care versus home care and invest significantly more into Oregon Project Independence, which can be more cost effective as well as generally preferred. All right. Thank you for that answer. Next question. Number three is, how would you prioritize state funding, including funding matched with federal funds, such as Medicaid, uh, for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Yeah, given my, my personal and professional experience, I hope you can see that I would certainly prioritize state funding for seniors and people with disabilities. I especially don't want to leave dollars on the table that are matched with federal funds, such as Medicaid, as you mentioned, and funds to help with healthy nutrition, such as funding for Meals on Wheels and other food benefits. I also believe in leveraging funds at every level and partnering with community stakeholders to increase access to needed services and to develop develop new programs and services such as the Memory Cafe movement. Um, I know that Center 50 Plus has a wonderful Memory Cafe um, program, services for people living with Alzheimer's and their families. Every Oregonian deserves access to safe housing, nutritious food, and the health care services they need. Okay, thank you. Uh, question four. Uh, during this time of increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level uh, so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a, a lack of accessible and affordable housing and receive appropriate nutrition? Um, I have to say that actually this is not just a state issue. We need to address the cuts to HUD, which has been cut nearly 75% since the Reagan, Reagan era which is one of the many reasons why this next election is so important at every level. Similar cuts have been recently proposed at the federal level to programs which help address food insecurity. And frankly, I'm worried that there will be cuts to Social Security and Medicare as well if we don't make a change in the direction we're going. Here at the state level, we need to work with every partner we can to address policies that are barriers to creating more affordable housing, for example. I was glad to see legislation recently passed here in Oregon that required zoning in urban areas for middle housing, such as duplexes in neighborhoods previously zoned for, uh, solely for single families. However, I've seen a number of these new duplexes going up, and sometimes the design doesn't fit with the neighborhoods and overshadows neighboring homes. 
how will that make the, feel, the new residents feel? They won't feel, feel welcome if their large homes overlook uh, and look down into other people's backyards. I think we have to work together for an Oregon that works for all. Affordability in housing needs to be addressed at every level, federal, state, county, city, and neighborhood association, and the same goes for food and security. No level of governance should get a pass on these critical issues. All right. Um, last question. Um, I wish there were more. I'm really enjoying this interview, Deb. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you. What are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre existing conditions? Well, it's awfully good to see more of us waking up to the realities that racial disparities exist between people of color and others. We certainly are seeing this. Um, the COVID-19 infection rates and death rates have shone a bright light on this issue as have other issues that we see around us. People of color have higher rates of diabetes, cancers, heart disease, and respiratory illnesses than others because of so many things. Disparities in income, which impact food and housing options, options, environmental factors, disparities in schools, which affect educational outcomes and future income, access to health care providers, treatment by health, the health care system, and the stress caused by racism itself. I'm gratified to see the work being done this summer by the Black Indigenous People of Color Caucus at the Oregon Legislature. It's a good start. We have a long way to go in our schools, in our health care systems, in our legislature, in our communities, and each and in each of our neighborhoods. All right, Deb, thank you. Thank thank you for the for taking the time from your day to to participate in this video. Well, I'm very grateful to you and for this opportunity. <laughs> and I wish every I hope everyone stays safe and well during this pandemic, and that we are able to safely move forward into a way we can get out there and be with each other again soon. Yeah. Whew. Once again, everyone, this is Deb Patterson, Democratic nominee for House Senate District 10. Deb, thank you. Thank you. The mission of Northwest Senior and Disability Services is to promote dignity, independence, and health, honor choice, and empower people. Long-term services and supports is a range of services for people with chronic illness, physical disabilities, or cognitive disabilities. Oregon Project Independence is a program that provides services such as personal care, home care services, chore service, adult daycare, and case management to seniors and people with disabilities living in their homes. The goal of this program is to promote independence and reduce the risk of institutionalization. Northwest Senior and Disability Services has information about long-term services and supports available in your community. Northwest Senior and Disability Services is an area agency on aging that serves both seniors and people with disabilities. An area agency on aging is a public or private nonprofit agency designed by the state to address the needs of these populations at the local level. We have volunteer advisory council openings on the Senior Advisory and the Disability Services Advisory Councils. Call 503-304 3451 for an application. Again, that's 503-304-3451 for an application. Information about Northwest Senior and Disability Services can be found on the agency's website, www.nwsds.org. Hello, I'm Chuck Richards and I'd like to welcome Max Sherman Republican candidate for House District 10. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here today. Yes. Tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage a senior or a person with a disability to vote for you. 35 years teaching high school agriculture. Uh, the last 12 here in Tillamook County. Uh, which is a low-income district. We have a lot of poverty, a lot of seniors and individuals that are struggling. One of the things I did as a teacher was I wrote a number of grants and got our uh, students involved in helping to solve hunger in our community. 
We worked closely with the food banks and made regular donations. My wife and I have a small produce business, and with COVID-19 creating the challenges that it has, uh, this past year we have decided that outside of uh, a couple of long-time uh, customers, we're actually donating uh, all of our produce to our, our local food banks and to our uh, food pantries. I've also pledged that uh, when I'm elected, that my uh, salary uh, for a legislator uh, minus or after taxes will be donated to uh, the food pantries and the uh, food banks within the group. So um, hunger among our elderly and among actually all populations is, is high priority with me. Oregon Project Independence is a cost-effective program that keeps seniors and people with disability in their own homes. And yet every year proposed funding of the OPI is significantly cut. If you, if elected, what would you do to protect funding on OPI? Well, one of the challenges we have with our uh, current legislators is that we have to uh, look at wants versus needs. And unfortunately, there are many special interest groups that are uh, involved with the process uh, for example, do we really need large tax credits for someone who wishes to buy a uh, fancy electric car? We need to take a look at where those funds are needed, uh, and we need to support those critical things such as such as OPI. Uh, it's much more cost effective. We need to keep seniors in their homes. We need to uh, work with families to be able to uh, to help help them with that. Uh, and it's going to save money for the state in the long run with uh, fewer hospitalizations, less long-term care facilities, and those types of things. So, uh, again, uh, one of my one of my concerns is uh, mental health and uh, and other health issues facing uh, seniors in all populations. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched w with federal funds? such as Medicaid, for services to an increasing senior and people with disabled population? Uh, well, one of the things I appreciate with the uh, uh, CARES Act is, is the ability that gives states to uh, have some control. And in Oregon, we're able to actually uh, utilize up to 137% of the poverty rate. Um, to provide services. Uh, we need to uh, look at, uh, again, long-term care. We need to look at the, uh, the funding streams for the services uh, that are provided, and those, again, need to be protected. Uh, we don't need to subsidize a 22-year-old uh, to get cheaper health insurance. We need those dollars to go towards uh, seniors and disabled uh, and to help make those things more affordable for them and to provide with them more services. During this time of increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face the lack of access, accessibility, affording housing and receiving appropriate nutrition. Okay, well, the nu nutrition, I believe I've, uh, I've, I've pretty much addressed already. It's a huge part of my campaign. Uh, affordable housing, we have a real issue here on the coast uh, with a lot of uh, high-priced vacation homes and second homes and a definite shortage in, in homes for elderly and people that have a, a lower income. Uh, we need to urge the legislators to work with the federal government, things like the Section 8 vouchers, uh, to include things such as shared housing and the ability of seniors who uh, have spent their lifetime building equity in a home and being able to stay in it and possibly bring somebody else in uh, to, uh, to help share costs. Uh, I strongly support a freeze on property tax for seniors. Um, we also need to start thinking outside of the box and, and look at some things like where we have uh, government-owned land uh, school districts that have large tracts, uh, other land that is not necessarily being used, and utilize that, that uh, land to uh, put in possibly apartments 
um, with COVID-19 uh, and more people working at home, there's a potential of buildings that are not going to be fully utilized and looking at apartments within those, uh, you know, and also providing other services with that. I believe we need to take a look at a model that Lane County has uh, where they're doing some work there with putting seniors into apartments. They have uh, health care and services available to them. What are your plans for improving health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health uh, disparities due to to pre-existing conditions? Okay, one of the things that I believe is extremely important that is provided by the Affordable Health Care Act is dealing with pre-existing conditions. And we don't know what's going to happen uh, with the next cycle of elections and how well that's going to hold up. But I believe the state of Oregon uh, needs to make a commitment uh, to protecting uh, pre-existing conditions. Those are extremely important for our seniors uh, and those with disabilities who run the risk of losing their insurance or not being able to get insurance that's affordable because of those issues. Um, we also need to take a look at uh, like here in, in District 10, uh, rural health health care. We have a lot of differences between what's available. Uh, we have a couple of cities that have some very, very nice hospital complex and access to, to top medical care and other communities that don't. Uh, I think the legislators need to look at ways we can help balance that. Um, VA uh, individuals in particular uh, have to travel to Portland uh, to get their health care. I think we need to take a look at things like small VA clinics uh, set up on the coast. It's going to save money. Other things such as uh, incentives um, through the teaching universities for medical students uh, to have part of their uh, uh, tuition reimbursed if they, if they help serve uh, rural areas. Uh, we just need to take a look at, uh, you know, and COVID-19 has also really brought out the, the need for looking at the cultural differences and how those groups have been unfairly affected. Thank you, Max Sherman, Republican candidate for House T District 10. Thank you very much. It was a very enjoyable time to, to, to share my views. And again, thank you for the opportunity. You're most welcome. Hello, I'm Roxanne Wilson, and I'd like to welcome Tim Daney, Green Party nominee for House District 17. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about this opportunity because, you know, we're all getting used to this technology, you know, and I've been on a lot of Zoom meetings, but this is my first Skype. I'm kind of a rookie when it comes to Skype myself. <laughs> so I was wondering if you can tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage a senior or a person with disabilities to vote for you. Well, I've been, uh, like I say, I've been in involved really in senior and disabled services for, um, you know, basically since I finished high school. Uh, I was in um, healthcare administration at OSU until I dropped out to concentrate on my own health. And, uh, and I've worked at uh, numerous nursing homes in various capacities. And I've worked for home health agencies and um, I've uh, been a friend, I, a friend to a, quite a number of elderly and uh, disabled folks over the years, and uh, and so I, I bring a perspective of observation and study um, to the to the process. And also, I think an important, valuable part of my running as a green is I'm not part of the current um, dynamic in this country, which is, I think, brought us to this crisis that we're at right now. I mean, we know we have a mental health crisis in Oregon. Oregon lags behind in mental health services. Um, we have an aging population. That How do we keep up with the needs that they have? So I'm just happy to be here, and I, I think I'll provide a valuable aspect to y'all, to the NWSDS work as a legislator. The Oregon Project Independence 
uh, or OPI is a cost effective program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their home. And yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. Now, if elected, could you tell us what you would do to protect funding for OPI? Well, I think I would definitely fight for the funding for OPI. Uh, I experienced that myself in a number of cases. Um, well, I was thinking of my aunt that helped raise me. I didn't have a father growing up, and my aunt helped raise me. And then as she aged, she was, you know, definitely wanting to stay in her home. And we tried to accommodate that as best we could until really she was no longer able to stay in her home. And that was sad. And maybe we didn't do a good enough job, my sister and I, I refer to, and my mother. But uh, then my mother, um, as she aged, she also had to, uh, um, well, she found her own way, essentially. But uh, um so many issues are brought up in thinking about my mother and my aunt's um, situations in life um, leads me to think that I will do everything I can to improve improve funding for senior and disabled services. Thank you, um, Ted. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds like Medicaid for services to an increase, increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Uh, well, you know, I need to get into the legislature really to see how it's all going and, you know, and follow the trail. You got to follow the money. And um, I think uh, I think that with new awarenesses and I think with, uh, you know, this, this um, you know, the whole social networking through the computer could improve things so that people can participate and not necessarily have to travel to be there. So, you know, I'll be looking at, you know, and I will we'll definitely be looking at how the money flows into the state and then how it's utilized within the state. Because as I say, uh, senior and disabled are our most vulnerable populations and we have to do whatever we can to care for them. Thank you, Tim. During this time of increased risk of hopelessness, um, excuse me, homelessness, but yeah, hopelessness too, <laughs> and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer fa face a lack of accessible, affordable housing and receive appropriate nutrition? Well, actually, that'll probably be a focus of mine is nutrition. And as far as people getting uh, uh, good nutrition, uh, not just calories, but, you know, the 90 essential mm -hmm. nutrients, vitamins, minerals and enzymes and everything that we need to improve and um, improve our immune systems. The immune system is what protects us from viruses such as COVID-19. And I'm not hearing enough focus on that in the media about the great need for everybody to focus on their own health. When I was at Lynn Benton Community College the first time, I put on a health forum, which I called Your Health is Your Wealth If You're Wise. And I'm not seeing a lot of wisdom out there. And I don't know where they're being educated. But we do know that we have a lot of addiction problems. And addictions lead to poor nutrition and bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I will just be concentrating my efforts to improve nutrition. And it may be that, you know, some things needs to be changed. Some needs to be kept the same. But anyway, I'll be I'll be focused on the problem because I think this is one of our biggest problems is that we do not take care of ourselves and improve our immune systems. True. Thank you, Tim. What are your plans to improve the health 
of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color, who traditionally suffer more from health disparities due to pre-existing conditions? Well, I guess two things are education. Education is most important, so they have to be educated. And sometimes it's difficult to educate them because they're locked into a mindset that keeps them um, from accepting new ideas that could improve their health. So it's a tough call. It's a it's a tough road. And 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 uh, uh, BIPOC, if you may know, stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> there's there's a st strong group up in Portland area. But uh, I. You know, like I say, I will be reaching out to all communities, no matter which community you're in. And um, I think I have connections throughout the state with a number of communities, such as uh, the Grange, which is on my shirt here, and uh, Odd Fellows, which remains a fairly sizable group community within Oregon. Uh, NAACP, which is a growing community in Oregon, and uh, increased uh, awareness of Black, Indigenous, uh, LBGTQ, A plus uh, communities, and so we will. We will. I plan to have the state actually listening to them. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. Once again, <laughs> thank you. Well, once again, this is Tim Daney, Green Party nominee for House District 17. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank you very much. Uh, did we go through all five questions already? It seemed to fly. Yes, I think we did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Angela Plowhead, and I'd like to welcome Paul Evans, incumbent Democratic candidate for House District 20. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. We're glad to have you. So tell us about the votes you cast last session that directly benefited seniors and people with disabilities. So what I'd like to say before I begin uh, talking specifically about legislation is that this last session, we actually weren't able to take votes that made an impact because our colleagues on the other side decided to walk out. And the things I've been able to accomplish and, and support really come from the 2019 session. When it comes to seniors, House Bill 2524, House Bill 3413. When it comes to people with disabilities, Senate Bill 493, 491, Senate Bill 19. We put 30 million in general fund to provide greater support for mandatory reporting of abuse. We've tried to move the ball forward, but it takes everybody working together in common cause. And unfortunately, in 2020, our colleagues on the other side decided that it was more important to make a political statement than actually meet the needs of seniors and those with disabilities. All right. On um, Project and Oregon Project Independence is a program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their homes. Yet every year, proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. If reelected, how will you ensure funding continues for this cost-effective program, especially during anticipated budget shortfalls? So Oregon Project Independence is one of those win-win environments. It is a good piece of legislation every time we've invested in it. And as a legislator in the last three terms, I've worked on investing in it, I think, twice, uh, expanding it. It is one of those programs that needs to be taken care of. However, we are facing, because of COVID, a very big budget deficit in the coming year. And we're going to have to either make some very hard choices or become more creative about finding revenues to support our needs. And I think that the voters will recognize that there's a fundamental difference over my six years as a record in how I approach problems than with uh, my current challenger. I don't promise things that I'm not willing to go fight for funding for. And uh, Project Independence is one of those things that I will continue to fight for. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, such as Medicaid, for services to increasing seniors and for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Again, over the last three uh, terms, I've worked very hard to optimize every federal match opportunity possible. 
with some, through something called the provider tax. We've expanded the scale and scope of healthcare for those at risk and seniors. We have worked on housing issues that are related to the well-being of both groups. Um, I will continue to prioritize what I like to call force enablers, those policies that unlock potential in other related areas. And I think it's critical that we look at healthcare, that we look at housing, that we look at transportation so that people can get to and from work, to and from medical care, to and from grocery stores. It's all interlinked. And the fundamental problem is we've been rearranging the deck chairs on a sinking ship. Our tax structure is really not robust enough to meet the needs of the 21st century. And as the wealth gap grows, we have to become even more creative, more innovative. And I think, quite frankly, a little more passionate about fighting for the values that make Oregon, Oregon. During this time of increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing and receive appropriate nutrition? So again, your, this particular question focuses on the interlinking between housing and food supply. I would actually add transportation healthcare to the to round it out. Uh, I will continue looking for ways in which we can help local communities identify areas that they can improve. When it comes to housing, there's no, unfortunately, the way the market works, there's no one solution, no cookie cutter approach. That said, I've worked on legislation that would provide incentives for building smaller houses. I'm working through the Emergency Preparedness and Veterans Committee on priorities that would produce more power and actually help in terms of infrastructure and transportation that might have a force enabler effect on development in communities. I've worked on trying to make sure that transit is much more available. We actually, uh, I was a, a leader in pushing the Salem-Kaiser Transit Board to change its governance so it could actually get more assistance, which means more routes, which means more opportunity for people to actually access places that their housing was unfortunately not located nearby when it was built. We have to approach it with a systemic mindset. And unfortunately, in today's politics, too many candidates will promise this one thing or that one thing without understanding that you have to approach a particular problem with a series of tools. You have to have a strategy that actually is integrated. And you have to actually recognize that some things cost money. As a Democrat, I don't believe we should tax just for the sake of taxing. On the other hand, with the greatest wealth disparity in American history, at least since the turn of the century, uh, 1890s to 1900s, we have to get smarter and better about providing social services. And I committed to do that. What are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre-existing conditions? Well, I would uh, my plan is to continue building on what I've done in the past, supporting every single expansion of Medicare, Medicaid. Again, integrating transportation so that people can get to and from their appointments, putting money behind telehealth, making sure that pharmacies are more uh, uh, fair in terms of the pricing. We've taken some moderate steps on that. Working with insurance companies so we don't have the wrong priorities for keeping people healthy. Part, part of the plan has to be immediate care of those that are in the most need, but also a strategic prevention strategy so that we actually keep people healthier for longer. That has to be a part of the equation as well. One of the things I've done as chair of the Veterans Committee is I've recognized that if we focus on trying to get veterans, which are about one out of every 11 citizens in, in Oregon, if we get veterans from the Oregon Health Plan into the Veterans Administration, it frees up space for more people on the Oregon Health Plan. If we get veterans into veterans housing and veterans home care facilities, it actually frees up space for other people because that's all federal money. So in a combination of trying to leverage every single federal dollar, treat our veterans with dignity, respect and the, and the uh, services that they deserve and fighting for more funding for the entire population, I, I think I have a pretty good record on how I plan on doing uh, what we've been doing over the past six years. Mr. Evans, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. I look forward to working with your organization as we move forward. And uh, hopefully everybody can enjoy this program without too much of uh, the sunshine and heat getting in the way.
<laughs> thanks again to Paul Evans, candidate for House District 20, and thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm Judy Richards, and I'd like to introduce Selma Pierce, Republican candidate for House District 20. Welcome. For helping me. Selma, tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage a senior or a person with disabilities to vote for you. Well, I am very supportive of services that are offered to seniors and people with disabilities to live a full and independent life. Almost every family member family has older or disabled family members. It is very important to everyone to care for them with dignity and love. Assistance in doing so is so very important, both for the families and the persons they are caring for, because it is hard work. I have helped to care for my mom and my 92-year-old mother-in-law for the past 12 years. My mother-in-law became disabled, she recovered, and now is able to age gracefully in her own home. Having gone through all of her ups and downs with her and helping her maintain her independence is really been eye-opening and gives me an idea of what all other families are going through. I am fully aware of the need for services and help that organizations such as Northwest Senior and Disability Services offer. The assistance they give to families is invaluable, particularly with help with meals, health and wellness, counseling, finances, and particularly family respite care. Oregon Project Independence is a cost-effective program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own home. And at every year, proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. If elected, what would you do to protect this funding for OPI? I would be voting for funding for this program, Oregon Project Independence. I know how important it is for seniors and people with disabilities to stay in their home, own homes where they can live comfortably with a little, little bit of help. Almost everyone I know, including my relatives, would prefer to stay in their own homes. This is their primary preference. Their greatest fear is that they will have to leave their homes. Project independence is cost effective, much less expensive than moving a person onto Medicaid and then into a facility. It allows many people to maintain their personal dignity and sense of self. They don't wanna to go to a facility, which is much more impersonal and is often disorienting to our family members. Often they are very lonely, isolated and sad when they have to move out of their homes. So it is of great importance that there are programs that help people stay in their homes because that is where our family members are the happiest. How would you prioritize state funding, including the funding that is matched with federal funds, such as Medicaid for services as to, to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? State funding for programs that aid our seniors and people with disabilities is very, very important. This helps lightens the load on families who are caring for their family members. Oregon should also pursue any federal funding available for seniors or people with disabilities. State and federal funding together give Oregon more resources to aid our older citizens and people with disabilities. This is important as our society ages and there are more people needing care. Funding should be spent on meals and nutrition, health and wellness, mental health help, transportation, home assistance, emergency housing help, and connections to services that help people live a fuller life. So I am very much in favor of prioritizing state funding for these programs. During the time of increased uh, risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities are no longer faced with a lack of accessible, affordable housing and receive appropriate nutrition? I am, a, a, I am very much in favor of maintaining funding for these programs because they do help our citizens quite a bit. So food and housing are some of our most basic needs. And with help from both federal and state funding, many seniors with disabilities can't stay in their homes. They're helped with delivered nutritional programs, such as Meals on Wheels, which my mother-in-law does uh, partake in, or in group gatherings for meals like those at Center 50 Plus. With collaboration between nonprofits and community organizations, such as Marion Pope Food Share or United Way, donations from supermarkets and other food providers, food insecurities are being addressed, especially at this time of the COVID pandemic. 
Many food providers are helping with providing clients with food boxes so no one goes hungry. And many community members have also helped, stepped up to help, as we have seen during the wildfires and people in the community saying, you know, I want to help. And they bring a lot of uh, goods and uh, materials to the centers where people can have resources that are later distributed to among those that are displaced. And housing is also an issue that our state wrestles with. We're already short of housing for our communities. So decreasing rules and regulations and simplifying build design requirements allow for more basic, simple, yet serviceable units that would help lower the cost of building affordable housing. This allows our seniors and people with disabilities on fixed incomes to have more access to homes to live in. What are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre-existing conditions? Many people in our society have chronic health problems, such as heart disease, lung disease, strokes, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and obesity. These conditions are prevalent among seniors and people with disabilities. We need an emphasis on healthy habits and lifestyles among all populations to reduce the prevalence and severity of chronic health conditions. And these kind of programs that would help people understand how to make themselves healthier, how to live a healthier lifestyle, should be culturally comp um, sensitive that work for different groups. Uh, I know my own grandmother was told she had diabetes and she was told to delete rice. And in that, her case, she felt like it was removing her lifeline and she was not used to that. So that didn't work for her. So we can develop programs that work for different communities and backgrounds. But this, this we should also have an emphasis on don't eat too much, don't smoke, don't take drugs, get some exercise and have a purpose in life. Even small changes can make a big difference in healthy outcomes for everyone. And I am happy that Northwest Senior Disability Services offer nutrition and meals and health programs that help to educate and help seniors and people with disabilities live healthier lives. Their healthy and nutrition meal programs are really a daily lifeline for many people. So this type of education really adds up to improvements for everybody. So I am pleased that right now we do have programs that help people tailor their lives so that they can live healthier and better lives that go into the future. But these should be also emphasized for our younger people so they will have much more um, of a healthy uh, older age. So that would be very nice too. Thank you. We have been visiting today with Selma Pierce, Republican candidate for House District 20. Well, I wanna say thank you very much for giving me this opportunity because as we live in a community with many people, we, many, many families have seniors or people with disabilities in their families that they're caring for. And it's nice for them to know that these resources exist to help everyone so everyone can have a happy life. Thank you. And thank you once again, Selma Pierce, Republican candidate for House District 20. I'm Judy Richards, and I'd like to welcome Jack S., Republican candidate for House District 21. Thank you for being here today, Jack. It's my pleasure. Tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage a senior or a person with disabilities to vote for you. I've been active in politics for a number of years and I started over in Eastern Oregon when I was away from the Capitol, but since then I have moved to the Capitol. I've worked closely with Oregon Citizens Lobby. I chaired the health care committee which is important to most all of us seniors. Uh, today, the major thing with the coronavirus is addressing the seniors, as seniors, like myself, are deemed more susceptible to the virus, especially those with pre-existing conditions. And that is where I need feel that the need needs to be addressed. Had this happened, when the virus first came out and the seniors being protected in nursing homes, senior living areas, and private homes, we would have had a lot less deaths in the senior community and a lot less action within the coronavirus. And I think if I can be elected, I have 
40 years of experience in healthcare management, and I believe that I can add some knowledge to our legislature in these areas. Thank you. Oregon Project Independence is a cost-effective program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own home. And yet every year, proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. If elected, what will you do to protect funding for OPI? The home is the best place to keep individuals if they have proper care. Uh, as I said, I worked 40 years in health care. Some of that was with nursing homes attached to acute care facilities. I observed in that situation that the individuals that didn't have the care at home and were placed in nursing homes, uh, I'm going to say nursing homes specifically, did not receive the emotional and family support needed for good health. Therefore, it would be my goal to direct funds more directly to in-home care than in care facilities, either nursing homes or senior care centers. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds such as Medicaid for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? That's a good question. Uh, how this money is distributed has got to be looked at seriously. Uh, I've got a little knowledge in health care. Uh, the seniors and the disabled are the highest risk population here, i.e., I'm saying that over single parents, male or female. Uh, and we need to look more directly at protecting our seniors. Again, I'll go back to combine. <laughs> 19. Uh, our state did not, nor did the nation, address the care of seniors and disabled people appropriately at the start of this epidemic. Uh, I think it is the legislature's responsibility to see these things and address them to protect those people to the highest level we can. Thank you. During this time of increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer lack or face a lack of accessible, affordable housing and receive appropriate nutrition? The homeless is a major problem we have right now. This has transpired greatly, I believe, by the action of the states over the last 10 years, closing mental health facilities around the state. Many of these people, not all, but many of these people want help, but they have no place to go to get this help. And therefore, they're sitting floundering on our streets. I know of personal instances where young men, middle-aged men, who had been drug addicted and recovered, and then through total fault of their own, dropped back into it. They wanted out, they couldn't get out. Uh, therefore, they were sitting homeless. I know of one that finally got into a program in Portland, whether this is young, middle-aged, or aged, that need help off of the streets and to get their life together. They need a program within the mental health division of the state. We have cut that back so far that these individuals are floundering. The one case I was referring to was lucky and got into a case in a program in Portland and for the last two years has been a security guard for Intel and is doing well. We need the state to address the mental health of our community to bring these people out of the problem they're in, those that want out. Those that don't want out, 
you tell me a way to work with that and I'll be happy to listen. Thank you. What are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre-existing conditions? Helping people of senior classification, I don't care whether they're white, green, blue, yellow, red, are all equal to me. People are people created by God. Now, what would we do? Let's go back into the mental health is a major area uh, that we can help these people. Other than that, giving care, in-home care, is, the, is very important to me. Uh, I strongly believe after my 40 years in healthcare that keeping people out of medical facilities is one of the best treatments available to our public. Thank you. Thank you once again. This is uh, Jack S. who is interviewing for the Republican candidate for House District 21. I want to thank you for joining us today for this interview with Jack. And I hope that you have enjoyed this as we have enjoyed meeting with Mr. S. Thank you again. Appreciate the time you provided me and my ability to address the concerns you are facing daily. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I am Mel Fuller, and I'd like to welcome Teresa Alonzo Leon, incumbent Democratic candidate for House District 22. Welcome, Teresa. Thanks for being here. Hello, Mel. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate being here today. Good. Let's just get it right to let's get right to the questions. Would you would you, Teresa, please tell us about the votes you cast last session that directly benefited seniors and people with disabilities? Thank you for the question, Mel. One of the bills that I was proud to sponsor during the 2020 session was House Joint Resolution 202, which proposed an amendment to the Oregon Constitution establishing the obligation of the state to ensure every Oregonian has access to cost-effective, clinically appropriate, and affordable health care. I feel that health care is a human right, and our seniors in Oregon with disabilities um, have access to health care systems that work for them. However, due to the Republican walkout, um, we did not uh, finish out the uh, session with uh, passing any legislative policies, but I am going to continue fighting on behalf of our elders and uh, folks with disabilities and all the Oregonians who does health, a strong health care system. All right. Next question is about Oregon Project Independence. Uh, Oregon Project Independence is a program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own homes, and yet every year, proposed funding for Oregon Project Independence is significantly cut. If reelected, how will you ensure funding continues for this cost-effective program, especially during anticipated budget shortfalls? Thank you for that question. I am proud to have hosted and had many OPI uh, folks in my office who share their stories and, and who um, advocate on behalf of um, helping and ensuring that our folks stay in their homes. And I, and I support that completely. I'll continue to fight for funding and, um, and support programs to ensure that um, our uh, folks um, in the OPI program continue to stay in their homes so that they can live with dignity I, I fully support that idea. Okay. Uh, next question, question number three. How, how would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, such as Medicaid, uh, for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? I think this needs to be one of our top priorities for the state. As we have seen from uh, ramifications of COVID-19, we did not 
have the proper infrastructure developed in our healthcare system to take care of some of our most vulnerable populations. As we move forward, we must use this experience and learn opportunities to increase funding to build a better healthcare system for generations to come. Funding program services that are matched with federal dollars is a top priority of mine. It makes sense for Oregon taxpayers to leverage federal funds to really stretch our dollars, especially when it comes to helping elders and folks with disabilities. Individuals who are living on a fixed income rely on these services to help them live in dignity, which all Oregonians deserve. Okay, thank you. Thank you. During this time of increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible, affordable housing and receive appropriate nutrition? We know that housing and food insecurities are affecting Oregonians of all backgrounds right now. And we know that permanent housing is the best solution to address homelessness. In the 2017 session, I supported Senate Bill um, 821, which directs Oregon Housing Stability um, which directs the Oregon Housing Stability Council to award grants to organizations that shall um, that uh, send out funds in emergency housing, um, al al which align with federal strategies and resources available to prevent and end homelessness. This will take time, and I was saddened to see that House Bill uh, 4001 died um, due to the Republican walkout as well. Um, this bill would have invested $45 million into opening homeless shelters, which would have provided almost immediate relief to the over 6,000 Oregonians who are homeless. It's important also to, um, for me to continue to uh, support and invest in our food banks and programs such as Meals on Wheels to ensure that people continue to get the food um, and uh, support that they need to continue living in dignity and, um, and continue to uh, feel supported and loved in our state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, final question, um, what are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors um, and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre-existing conditions. Thank you for that question, Mel. Within the last five months, I have seen firsthand that disparity are health gates for vulnerable communities. In my district and in Marion County in general, we know that COVID-19 is especially hard hitting on vulnerable communities who suffer from diabetes, heart disease, and are in need of dialysis. A big issue I see is Latinos have historically lower rates of health insurance, which in turn deters people from seeking health care. Too many lack access to health care or to the federal benefits that so many people need during these times. I, am I will continue to advocate for and create policies that create a more culturally competent health care system system so that more Oregonians can feel safe and that they are able to seek out medical attention need, as well as working to expand affordable health care that is equitable and that is coming from a lens where, um, where we need to ensure that people feel comfortable seeking health care. All right. Well, that was all of our questions. Uh, Ter Teresa, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciated this opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. Uh, once again, everyone, this is Teresa Alonzo Leon, incumbent Democratic candidate for House District 22. I'm Judy Richards, and I'd like to welcome Alex Holocaust, Green Party candidate for House District 23. Well, thanks so much for having me here, Judy. Appreciate the opportunity. It's a pleasure. Tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage a senior or a person with a disability to vote for you. Well, for one thing, I am a senior. Uh, now, most of my friends and family are uh, seniors. Um, so I've been exposed to a lot of the issues that seniors are facing. For one thing, I recently retired. So I lost my employer-based insurance, which a lot of 
people do, not just seniors. Um, and so was exposed to the shockingly high uh, premiums and deductibles that people face out on the open market. So um, as part of that, I've been advocating for uh, universal health care for many, many years now. And so I'm a member of Mid Valley Healthcare Advocates and Healthcare for All Oregon, who have been advocating for universal uh, publicly funded uh, uh, health care for, for all Oregonians. So I've been involved in that for quite a while. Uh, I've done quite a, a bit of volunteering. Um, apart from that, my uh, governmental experience is as, as a board of directors for the Corvallis Rural Fire Protection District. So I've been exposed to budgeting and governance issues that way as well. Thank you. Oregon Project Independence is a cost-effective program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own home, and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. If elected, what would you do to protect the funding for OPI? Well, I would do whatever I can because I, I think it's a great idea to allow uh, seniors to age in place and uh, those who are disabled, allow them to remain in their homes. Um, for one thing, um, it's good for the, their health, both uh, physical and mentally, to stay in their community, uh, as well as it's good for the community to have that th them be there, have that continue. So it's a win in, uh, on that respect, in that respect. Um, also, it's cost effective, as you said, because it costs a lot less to allow people to remain in their home than to house them somewhere in some uh, residential facility uh, could be an order of magnitude of savings. So um, it's a win win as far as the government's concerned. So I would do what I whatever I could to uh, support that beyond, you know, beyond it being a pilot project, have it be a continued uh, supported um, agency. Thank you. Alex, how would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds such as Medicaid for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Well, that, that funding is critical. And um, I support efforts like uh, we have some great representatives like Dan Rayfield who has fought to keep that funding established. You know, we have Oregon, fortunately, was one of the states that expanded Medicaid um, right away with the Affordable Care Act. So I support that expansion. I would support expanding it further, um, as well as, as I said before, I'm, I'm a proponent of universal health care. So, so I'm supporting even beyond Medicaid, having everyone covered. Uh, but mm -hmm. in the meantime, I would uh, fully support and think that's critical to keep the, the, those funds established and would support current efforts in the legislature uh, to keep that funding in place, like what Representative Frayfield did. Thank you. During the time of increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what would you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible, affordable housing and receive appropriate nutrition? Well, I think there's lots of ideas bandied about of how to how to address the homeless situation. I think there's some good ones as far as um, changing zoning regulations, allowing more higher density uh, housing, um, as well as uh, ADUs or accessory dwelling units so that especially for uh, those who don't require large houses, it's something affordable um, that can help alleviate the crisis. I think one thing that could really benefit uh, the communities that uh, NWSDS serves as well is um, public housing. And one thing I'm a big proponent of is uh, establishing a, an Oregon State Bank. So part of the things that the state bank could do is uh, finance uh, public infrastructure. And one of, the, one of the things that that could go towards is um, more public housing. So because right now we're in a definite crisis, not just for seniors and those who are disabled, but the whole, popu the whole population looking at um, uh, potential, potential homelessness. So uh, that's what I see as... as I mean, I'm not I'm not an authority on it. I would be would 
as I learn more, I would be looking at other solutions. But that's one thing I see as as steps to addressing that, as well as again for nutrition, fully funding um, SNAP programs and um, OAA for those who aren't covered by uh, the SNAP. Thank you. What are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre-existing conditions? Um, well, not to sound like a broken record, but again, you know, I'm a big supporter of universal health coverage. That's for all Oregonians. Um, and, uh, from a publicly funded system to keep profits out of the system. So that would help address uh, that, that vulnerable population as well as what's happening with communities of color, especially in, during this pandemic. Um, we're seeing them in you know, more um, an exaggerated impact on communities of color. And basically it's a lack of affordable, accessible healthcare uh, leading to condition, you know, chronic conditions, which makes them more susceptible to uh, things like this pandemic. So uh, that's that's one way I would address it. Also, the um, people who are even on Medicare still can wind up making terrible decisions as far as what are they going to pay for their prescription drugs versus, you know, rent, food, um, utilities. So part of that problem is the, the built in outrageous uh, costs of pharmaceuticals and prescription drugs. So even in Medicare, um, we still have seniors looking to have to go outside the country to get their prescription drugs. So universal health coverage, single payer system or publicly funded system would address that, as well as things like still having to pay premiums uh, for, for supplemental like Medicare Advantage, which is going to insurance company profits when that money could be uh, going towards health care instead of propping up insurance companies. So it's something I feel very strongly on and would sponsor legislation for that uh, if elected. Thank you, Alex. Once again, thank you, Alex Polakoff, Green Party candidate for House District 23. Well, again, thank you so much for having me um, and stay safe. And I want to thank everyone. For, th for tuning in and listening to my interview today with Alex Polikoff, Green Party candidate for House District 23. Hello, my name is Betty Sledge. I'm with the Senior Advisory Council um, at NWSDS, and I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Lynette Shaw. She's the Democratic candidate for House District 24. We're going to be uh, interviewing Annette to Lynette today on uh, issues that have to do with seniors and people with disabilities. Thank you so much, Betty. It's really a pleasure to be here. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come speak with you today. Okay, well, we'll get started. Um, tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage people, seniors and people with disabilities to vote for you. Sure. Um, Right now, while we're really in the middle of this uh, global pandemic that has been um, there's so much uncertainty associated with it, the very th first thing that I'd say to seniors and folks with disabilities is that you deserve representatives in Salem who understand and have experience with public health and science and healthcare delivery. Um, I have a public health and science education and I understand very clearly uh, where we are with our current crisis and the importance of safety measures for all Oregonians, particularly those with health conditions that predispose them for worse outcomes. Uh, and uh, I've organized and worked in clinical uh, patient trials. I've worked one-on-one -on -one with patient groups seeking cost-effective and clinically appropriate and affordable health care. And I've trained and worked alongside doctors and nurses in clinical situations for years. So I understand the strengths and weaknesses of our current system very clearly. Okay, great. Um, Oregon Project Independence, or OPI, is a cost-effective program designed to keep seniors and people with disabilities in their homes. Um, yet every year uh, when there's proposed funding for OPI, it's severely and significantly cut. So if you were elected, what would you do to protect funding for this important program, OPI? 
Well, first I'd say this, we really cannot balance our budgets on the backs of the most vulnerable Oregonians. It's pure irresponsibility. Um, OPI provides benefits some, for some of our most vulnerable citizens, and it's important to continue to prioritize that need and prioritize the dignity and the safety and the social benefit of a program like OPI. Um, and by prioritizing funding stability for the project independence, we can provide a great benefit for older Oregonians by allowing for uh, longer term individual care planning that allows folks to work with their doctors and, and their families and other professionals to understand how aging in place will not uh, will affect their health care decisions and also their finances and their social and family decisions that just have a ripple effect in the community. Uh, so the mental health benefits of maintaining independence really can't be underestimated and we can see better out health outcomes and lower care costs too with strategies like OPI. Okay. So talking about prioritizing state funding, um, how would you prioritize state funding, including funding that has matching funds with federal dollars, like uh, Medicaid, for instance, for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? Well, even before our current crisis, I saw too many of our neighbors struggling to afford uh, the essentials um, that, that uh, you know, that they need. Um, and uh, it's uh, like housing and healthcare and things like that. So the pandemic, of course, has exacerbated those problems and exposed uh, inequities uh, like never before. And it's my belief that we're really seeing the beginning of it just right now. So um, we, um, I think it's important for us to uh, really look at where we're spending that money and understand that health doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, and it's incumbent on us to address the uh, determinants of health really at the source and use our budgets uh, to address those costly determinants uh, like uneven access to health and social and economic opportunities and resources and that sort of thing. So during this time, um, there's an increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities. Uh, what would you do at a state level uh, so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible, affordable housing or proper nutrition? Um, I think that we really should be looking at things, uh, social determinants of health. And as a, in my public health background, uh, this is uh, really kind of what we're trained to do. Um, those determinants drive about 80, 80 to 90 percent of the health outcomes uh, that, uh, but they receive only about 10 percent of our targeted funding. So our system is kind of sagging under its own weight right now, but we can reimagine that uh, when we are looking at things like how we deliver our health care. Um, we've chosen to place our current cultural value on a, on a very much a fee-for-service sort of model, but that really doesn't equip or reimburse healthcare providers for extending care beyond the four walls of the clinic or the hospital. Um, and if we switch to a value-based delivery model, uh, um, we can, it's a care model that prioritizes wellness and it prioritizes keeping patients healthy uh, outside of the clinical interface. And we can uh, give providers flexibility to incorporate solutions that bring things like nutrition and basic safety and housing to the table when you're crafting treatment strategies. And the results of that are better outcomes for more people uh, and reduced costs of care. So you get equitable and effective and a less expensive, expensive system. Okay. So what are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable uh, citizens, people with disabilities, even people of color who traditionally suffer from health disparities based on um, pre-existing conditions. Right, well, you know, it's it, at a time that we're kind of holding together a very stressed out and kind of patchwork system that has seams that are starting to split and show um, inadequacies of the origins of, those, of that system. We can really think about reimagining what our future can look like. We can build a system using our existing infrastructure to provide a public option for folks who need care can get it without worrying about drowning themselves in medical debt. 
um, or rationing prescriptions or opting out of uh, a recommended care. Um, we can leverage the cost savings of providing uh, that vertically integrated uh, health services in a really comprehensive and patient-centered and uh, prevention-focused model. Uh, those coordinated care models really lower barriers to care that are the origins of disparities in outcomes. Uh, and we can update our delivery model to include things like telehealth and value-based care and primary care home models really centering the needs of underserved and underreached populations um, in every setting, kind of focusing our systems on providing better outcomes for a larger population and in a more cost-effective way. It's possible, it's very much possible. We have uh, the technology to do that and we have the ability to do that and we have the data. We just need to want it bad enough to elect legislators willing to fight for it. Okay, well, Lynette, those are excellent um, thoughts and I'm so glad that you took the time to share with us today. Um, we look forward to meeting you in person one day when um, the pandemic is uh, uh, maybe per not, perhaps not over, but there's more uh, time to be able to move around. Um, and thank you very much for the gift of your time. Absolutely. Again, this is Lynette. She's the Democratic candidate for uh, the House District 24. Thanks, Betty. Thank you, everyone. I'm Stephen Manessis. I'd like to welcome Debbie Booth Schmidt, Democratic candidate for House District 32. Hi, Stephen. How are you today? Just, just fine. Tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage a senior or person with disabilities to vote for you. I help take care of my mother-in-law. She's 83 years old and she's living in independently in a community that she's very happy in and has lots of friends. I would do anything I could to make sure that she is able to stay living independently. The idea of giving people the resources that they need to live on their own and be ind independent is something that I believe in for all seniors and, dis and people with disabilities. Unfortunately, the population needing care is growing at a rate faster than what there are care providers. When I'm in Salem, I want to make sure, I want to work with our stakeholders, with folks like you, and find a way to support our care providers and their clients. Thank you. Oregon Project Independence is a cost-effective program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own home, and yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. If elected, what would you do to protect funding for OPI? I strongly agree that we must allow everyone to make the decisions that they know are best for themselves and then provide the tools that they need to be independent. From what I know, aging in place is the best option for people that don't need intensive medical care. I, can, I see how these services continue to help give di dignity to those who can't fully take care of themselves but that don't need the 24 hour medical services. Knowing that the state is going to face tough budget decisions in 2021, I wanna be in Salem. I wanna be an ally in fighting and protecting the funding for OPI. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, such as Medicaid, for services to an increasing senior people with disabilities population? With the budget sh shortfall the state will be facing because of the impact of the pand pandemic, we should prior prioritize not cutting services that receive federal matching funds. Because if we reduce $100 million of state funds, we could be losing hundreds of millions of dollars from federal government. We should not be leaving any money on the table and we should be maximizing the use of our federal funds. When I get to Salem, my top priority is ensuring 
that our most marginalized communities are getting the services that they need. From our schools to our social services, I will advocate for the funding that does not get cut. During this time of increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible and affordable housing and receive appropriate nutrition? We need to continue to help our lower income residents with their housing or we will have more homeless. And in the long run, that's gonna cost the state more. Again, looking forward to the budget situation we'll be, we will be facing in 2021, I will absolutely fight to protect the funding that goes towards our, social, our, our critical social services. Clatsop County has the highest rate of homelessness per capita in the state, yet nearly all of the state funding to address homelessness has been going to Portland, not to our rural counties. There needs to be legislation that ensures that the communities are also getting the funding that they need. We also need to continue to provide food stamps and nutritional services to our elderly and people with disabilities. What are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre-existing conditions? For starters, I believe that we need to protect the progress we have made in services for our vulnerable seniors, people with disabilities and BIPOC. We also need to assess what these communities need. We need to make culturally responsive effort by talking to our BIPOC communities and centering them in our policies. My current understanding is these communities have fallen through the cracks and have not received the support that they need. The systematic way that BIPOC have lacked access to healthcare and nutritional resources have set them up to have these negative health outcomes. So we need to look upstream to how we can prevent these issues. Through this, though this is vital that I look with, that I work with our seniors, our people with disabilities and BIPOC and adversary at organizations like yours and not just assume I know what they need. I need to go out and talk with them, see what they really need and then lead and have them help us lead the policy decisions. Thank you for your very <laughs> candid and thoughtful responses, Debbie. You're welcome, Steve, anytime. Once again, this is Debbie Boo Schmidt, Democratic nominee for House District 32. Hi, my name is Linda Crandall. I'm a member of the Northwest Senior and Disability Services Council. And I'd like to introduce Suzanne Weber, Republican candidate for House District 32. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today to share your positions in, to, for the voters. Thank you so much for the for the invitation, and I uh, really appreciate being able to be here and um, talk with you. Tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage a senior or persons with disabilities to vote for you. Well, I have a lot of experience. Um, I have lived on the North Oregon coast for 50 years. I came here to stay for two years and then go back to northern Minnesota, the mosquitoes in the snow, and uh, found that I loved this area and all that it had to offer. And so I have been actively involved, not only in raising my family, but in uh, teaching um, services to my church, services to my community as the mayor and uh, city council member, and um, services to my county uh, with the Housing Commission, realizing all of uh, what we have as challenges in that area and to the greater um, area with uh, the uh, Clatsop, Columbia and Washington counties working on economic development and transportation. 
Thank you for that answer. On another note, Oregon Project Independence is a cost-effective program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their own home. And yet every year proposed funding for OPI is significantly cut. If elected, what will you do to protect funding for OPI? I realize how important it is for seniors especially and people with disabilities to be able to stay in their own homes. Uh, I think it, it increases um, the length of time that they are able to live and their comfort and their um, mental uh, assuredness that you know they're in uh, surroundings that are familiar to them. And I really um, had no idea how the proposal for funding was cut um, and what kind of considerations were taken in as they were cut. And so I really need to find out more about that. And I need to, uh, I need to research how it is that these cuts are being determined and where they are being determined from. Uh, I know that I have several friends who help seniors remain in their home. And um, it's so important that they are there. I really appreciate your answer. For the next question, how would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, such as Medicaid for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? That is something I have to learn about. I have never had to take advantage of those sorts of uh, funding, and I have not had the um, experience uh, to learn about that. And it's something that in reading the, the questions prior um, to this interview, I started to do research on it, and um, it, it, it's very involved, it's very complicated, but it needs to have someone who can represent the feelings of the people, the wishes of the people, and be able to take the common sense uh, to sustain life at its highest quality to the legislature so that um, the legislature can then use those funds as wisely as possible um, to be able to sustain our elderly and our, our uh, citizens with disabilities um, to the best uh, of their, you know, life. Thank you. During this time of increased risk of homelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on a state level so that people and seniors with disability, uh, seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible, affordable housing and re receive appropriate nutrition? I have worked on the on the Tillamook County Housing Commission since it began because I felt that we had a real need for uh, housing for our um, affordable housing for our workers, which would then free up more housing uh, for our elderly population. Um, homeless homelessness is something that I have been working on in our community. Uh, and quite frankly, it, it is a very difficult situation because it involves so much more than just losing your home. Uh, there are um, issues with mental health that also need to be addressed. Um, food insecurity is something that uh, working with uh, the food bank and uh, the pantries. And for the final question, what are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including people of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre-existing conditions? I think that uh, universal insurance has to be a part of this. Now, that's not necessarily something that's popular, uh, but I feel that uh, medical um, ex um, Accessibility to medical um, facilities is very important. Um, I think that um, 
especially for the uh, vulnerable. I think that we need to increase our um, ability to to do the telemedical in this area, especially. Um, I I'm on a learning curve. Before I decided to do this job, there were a lot of things that I took for granted. And now that I have decided to run for this office, I, there are a lot of things I need to learn. I need to learn about the health and, of seniors. Um, I have worked for uh, County Wellness um, ever since its inception also, which also benefits seniors and people with disabilities. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today and to share your positions and your experience so that voters can make an informed choice. I want to thank you for inviting me. Again, this is Suzanne Weber, Republican candidate for House District 32. Hello, I'm Roxanne Wilson, and I'd like to welcome Arlene Burns, Democratic and Independent nominee for House District 59. Thank you. Arlene, I was wondering if you could tell us about your positions and your experience that would encourage a senior or a person with disabilities to vote for you. Well, um, alas, and thank goodness, in a sense, I've had quite a lot of experience in primary caregiving. Uh, when I was 33, my boyfriend at the time was the only survivor of a helicopter crash. So I took care of him through nine surgeries. And, um, and then my mom had a very severe stroke right after that. And I was her primary caregiver for the first six months after her stroke. And then my husband had was diagnosed with a, a terminal brain cancer. So I quit my job, wow. my income and my insurance and, and took care of him uh, through four brain surgeries, paralysis and blindness until he died. And my dad is 97 years old now. So we've been navigating wow. this towards his care and um, and in all of these, I really believe that being able to be at home and being with the ones you love and having the support system available is crucially important. And um, and it makes all the difference. One, keeping people out of a uh, of a hospital system um, and having I mean, for me, it was wild because it was like I was supporting him, but who was supporting me? So I really kind of firsthand understood the importance of advocacy and also the importance of, first of all, friends and family, but some kind of system in place that is understanding that this is very important, crucial work. You, do you know about the Oregon Project Independence? It's a, co a cost-effective program that keeps seniors and people with disabilities in their homes, um, the way you were just talking about. Um, and one thing that we have run into is that every year proposed funding for, for Oregon Project Independence is significantly cut. And um, that does affect people like your family members that, and I'm sorry for your losses, by the way. Um, so we were also wondering if elected, what would you do to protect the funding for uh, OPI? Well, I think the main thing is keeping it on everybody's radar that this is really important and also understanding that keeping people at home where they're more comfortable and to have the people they love around them is a, much less of a quote burden on the larger system of having people in hospitals. So yeah, I think it's um, to me, it's really, really important because I've lived it. And um, actually we ended up um, the last nine months of my husband's life went to Italy partially because there, that kind of care was there, that sort of support for being at home and in the States it really wasn't there or available. I mean, we kept on moving from state to state because we were at, uh, originally in Telluride when he got sick. So I understand that, um, you know, I think it's just a matter of keeping it as a priority and not letting it slip. And, um, and then, you know, under, maybe communicating uh, more thoroughly why it's so important and also what the resources are. Thank you, Arlene. How would you prioritize state funding, including funding that is matched with federal funds, um, like Medicaid, mm -hmm. for services to an increasing senior and people with disabilities population? 
Well, first of all, I am one of those now. I just turned 60 years old, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm to that category. And I understand, too, I'm a baby boomer, and there are more of us aging than there are people replacing us. And so this has been an issue for a long time with how to fund this. And fortunately, our Oregon senators, I think, are really on board with the importance of this. And um, I think communicating, first of all, with our federal representatives, so in Congress and in the Senate, those are priorities. So Medicaid is not cut. I'm really proud of Oregon in general for kind of being forward thinking in all of this. And really just with equity, we have to keep all of our youngest and our oldest and our poorest lifted for a society to be healthy and strong. So for me, it's just kind of a no brainer that 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 is earmarked and it's communicated in a way that people get it. And I think everybody's got a, got a father, got a grandparent. And if mm -hmm. um, they, they have, they will become the, an older person too. So it's, it's not an issue that anyone is immune from. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, during this time of increased risk of hopelessness and food insecurities, what will you do on the state level so that seniors and people with disabilities no longer face a lack of accessible, affordable housing and receive appropriate nutrition? Well, again, I think it's just keeping it on the radar and making sure that resources are available. And I really believe also in working on local and regional levels to be able to provide um, farm fresh produce. Uh, and mm -hmm. and we had actually, my dad was at Hawks Ridge for a little while in Hood River, and there was a little farm stand right outside on the property where people could come out and actually buy. And I think there's a lot that could be done on a local regional level uh, with farmers even donating food and fruit and whatever they're growing, whether it's in excess or just as a tithe to um, seniors. We have in our town a, um, a, a little compound where we have our city council meetings or used to before they were, uh, before they were all virtual. But um, so we have a big effort all the time to make sure these seniors there have meals uh, cooked for them two or three times a week and enough is cooked so that there's food available the other days of the week that they can take home. And I think it's just, again, us understanding what being part of a community is and, and it's mm -hmm. everyone taken care of. That's awesome. Thank you, Arlene. What are your plans to improve the health of vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities, including those of color who traditionally suffer from more health disparities due to pre-existing conditions and environmental factors? Well, it's really tricky right now because we're isolated uh, from having one-on-one -on -one contact. And I think this has been a real struggle for all of us in trying to deal with someone who is sick or, or isolated because of COVID when you can't see them. So this is a whole new challenge that no one thought about, you know, six months ago is how do you comfort someone who is dying, a family member, when you can't be by their side? And... Um, and also the risk of young people infecting older people. So this is a new paradigm, and I think we need to come up with solutions. And thank goodness, maybe you know, technology in a sense can help, you know, bring that communication more thoroughly, so people can be on on a computer and at least see the faces of their loved ones. But again, I think it's a matter of keeping it on the radar, keeping it on the screen whenever you're making decisions about housing, about uh, about how to provide food to make sure that the most vulnerable are part of that conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Arlene. I really appreciate you joining us today. Okay. Thank you. And once all? again, yes, once again, this is Arlene Burns. Uh, she is the Democratic and Independent nominee for House District 59. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want to thank the candidates on behalf of the members of the Senior Advisory Council and Disability Services Advisory Councils of the Northwest Senior and Disability Services for attending our candidate interviews. Copies of the interviews can be checked out from Northwest Senior and Disability Services by calling 503-304-3451. Again, that number was 503-304-3451.
We hope the information that has been provided will help you make informed choices when you vote. The opinions expressed here are not endorsed by Northwest Senior and Disability Services. For more information or to get connected to services provided by Northwest Senior and Disability Services, please call 1-866-206-4799. Again, that number is 1-866-206-4799. The Advisory Councils for Northwest and Senior and Disability Services would like to thank Capital Community Media for their production of the forum. Thank you for watching.